When is peak winter, really? When is the coldest, snowiest, or otherwise most challenging part of the winter? If you ask this question to different people across the Northern Hemisphere, you're likely to get some very different answers. Not only is our perception of winter shaped by many factors, but all of those factors vary widely across the Northern Hemisphere. There are some areas where the coldest month of the year is as early as December, while there are other places where March is colder than December. There are places where the snowiest time of year is as early as October, and other areas where it's as late as March. That same variability applies to fog, clouds, wind, and storms. In this video, we'll uncover some of these patterns to get a better sense of how winter varies not just across time, but across geographic space as well. Now, the meteorological definition of winter is basically what you'd expect. December, January, and February. It's very useful in many discussions to have this definition, to have the year divided into four roughly equal seasons. And indeed, on average across the Northern Hemisphere, December, January, and February tend to be the coldest three months of the year. But even this isn't true everywhere. And if you look more closely to try to find out what the coldest two months or single month is, you'll find it varies widely depending on where you live. Ultimately, what is driving the winter season is the change in sun angle and day length. But if the sun was the only factor that mattered, the coldest time of year would be on the winter solstice, around December 21st in the Northern Hemisphere. This is when we receive the smallest amount of energy from the sun, because the days are shortest and the sun angle is lowest. It would also mean that November would be at least as cold as February. In most areas, of course, this is not the case. And if you know anything about Earth science, you probably know why. Seasonal lag. It takes time for Earth's land and air, but even more so its water, to heat up and cool down. Thanks to the high heat capacity of water and its vertical convection, lakes and seas can store an enormous amount of heat in summer, and they can release that heat into the air above them during fall and winter. As a trade-off, this also saturates the air, leading to greater cloud cover and precipitation in the areas downwind. In spring and early summer, as the water is storing heat, it has a cooling effect. This produces seasonal lag. But usually the lecture on seasonal lag stops there, and people are left with a glaring false assumption. Do we find the greatest winter seasonal lag downwind of the largest oceans? Well, not necessarily. On most of the U.S. West Coast, winter seasonal lag is actually very limited. And Western Europe, downwind of the Atlantic Ocean, overall has more moderate seasonal lag than you might expect. Throughout Western Europe, February is definitely colder than December, and January is, on average, the coldest month of the year. That's about the same amount of seasonal lag that you'll find in most of the eastern U.S. Now, to be fair, seasonal lag is more significant on the most northern coastlines, Norway, for instance. But this isn't where we find the most dramatic seasonal lag in the world. And there is one basic reason for this ocean circulation. Simply put, the surface water which cooled off here in winter isn't here in spring. It's being constantly replaced by warmer water from warmer latitudes. As it cools off, it either sinks or flows north or south. And we know from climate modeling studies that Europe would be much colder in late winter and spring if it weren't for this highway of heat. There would be much greater seasonal lag. A similar ocean circulation pattern exists in the North Pacific, limiting seasonal lag there as well. Surprisingly enough, there are places with very significant seasonal lag around much smaller bodies of water for this reason. They're not benefiting from a strong warm current. The water that cooled off in January is still there in July. Around the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, and even the Great Lakes, you can find many coastal locations where February is the coldest month of the year, or where March is colder than December. So where do we find the most dramatic seasonal lag? The true king of seasonal lag is the Arctic Ocean, including Hudson Bay. This is a relatively isolated body of water. There's one large warm current cutting into it, keeping an ice-free area just north of Europe, and most of that water sinks above Norway, returning to the North Atlantic. Otherwise, the Arctic Ocean is a massive expanse of stubborn, cold water trapped at high latitudes, which is retained for a long time. Even the Bering Sea is in a similar situation. It misses out on the warm Alaska current to the south. The icy Labrador current coming down from the Arctic also extends the area of high seasonal lag. 
Once the Arctic sea ice cover is at its maximum, usually around February or March, it really won't add much heat to the atmosphere above it, making those months much colder. March is significantly colder than December around the Arctic Ocean, and February is the coldest month of the year, on average. Now, maybe you don't care about the Arctic Ocean itself, but it has wide-reaching impacts on the Northern Hemisphere. Essentially, the Arctic Ocean serves as a source of extremely cold air masses very late in the winter, even in spring. Remember, prevailing wind patterns are just a long-term average, and cold air masses, including those from the Arctic Ocean, can move in any direction. As a result, some of the most devastating winter storms in history have been in March. Cold air is only one ingredient, but a key ingredient in creating these storms. And this late winter cold from the Arctic Ocean affects some areas more than others. Overall in North America, you see a trend of increasing winter seasonal lag toward the northeast. There are many reasons for this, but in part it's because this region is more often influenced by cold northerly or northwesterly winds from the Arctic Ocean, thanks to its position west of the Icelandic Low, which constantly throws cold air south into the region. Another factor increasing seasonal lag is snow. Snow has a very profound cooling effect on a local and global scale. Without snow, the sun warms the Earth's surface and the surface warms the air above it. But with a highly reflective layer of snow, the daytime temperatures barely rise at all so temperatures the following night drop even further. For that reason, many locations experience their coldest weather after a good layer of snow is already down. And the deeper the snow accumulates, the longer it's going to take to melt away in spring, so temperatures will stay low for longer. So what about the opposite? Where does the coldest weather come early and leave early? Well, seasonal lag is very limited across the vast interior grasslands and deserts of Eurasia as you would imagine in these highly continental climates. It gets very cold very quickly, with December and January being far colder than February. In winter, the coldest place in the Northern Hemisphere, aside from the top of the Greenland ice sheet, is over the forests and tundra of eastern Siberia. And December is far colder than February here as well. And this cold, dry Siberian air is thrown south into China throughout the winter, creating the same pattern there unless you're right on the coast. With the exception of offshore islands and peninsulas, seasonal lag is very limited in East Asia compared to Eastern North America, thanks to this Siberian air. The Aleutian Low helps to force cold air southward into East Asia, just as the Icelandic Low does in Eastern North America. But this cold air is much more continental in origin. And even the people in Western Europe have to keep this cold, continental air in mind. For those living north of the Alps in particular, very cold continental air can sweep in from the east periodically. And this air will already be very cold very early in the winter. Some of the most limited winter seasonal lag in the world can be found in Western North America. In much of the Intermountain West, December is, surprisingly enough, the coldest month of the year on average. Most of the Intermountain West sits at a high elevation. Even those sagebrush-covered plains are well above sea level, and dozens of mountain ridges rise even higher, in stark contrast to areas east of the Rockies, where Arctic air masses can easily sweep down without opposition. This region is largely buffered from the effect of those air masses by the Rockies. But it still gets very cold here for a different reason. Any time you combine a high elevation with dry air and clear starry skies, your nighttime temperatures will drop rapidly. And the longer the nights, the colder it will get. So the coldest temperatures here do tend to stay closer to the winter solstice. In fact, in some areas, the average nights in November can be even colder than those of February. Northern Nevada, in particular, is also covered with frost hollows, or areas where cold air pools at night. And the longer the night, the more those cold air pools can develop. So the next time you're driving across Interstate 80 in early winter or even fall, that's something to keep in mind. What's even more surprising is that the coldest time of year comes very early on the West Coast as well. On most of the U.S. West Coast and up to Vancouver, December is on average the coldest month of the year. How could this possibly be the case in such an oceanic climate? Well, the key may be farther west over the North Pacific. In early winter, the westerly winds here are highly zonal, 
or in other words, they're moving very directly west to east. But in midwinter, as the Aleutian Low grows in strength and the North Pacific High moves to the south, the westerlies tend to take a deep dive into the subtropics before swinging up again to the west coast of the U.S. and Canada. We know that this flow pattern is part of what helps keep western coastlines warmer in winter, and there's quite a bit of a delay here. And for the North Pacific, this difference probably matters quite a lot due to sea surface temperatures. At high latitudes, the North Pacific is much colder than the North Atlantic overall because the warm currents are weaker here and don't extend as far north. Now, of course, you can't talk about winter weather without talking about snow. Snow needs both sufficient moisture and sufficiently cold temperatures, so the coldest time of year will largely depend on when those two factors align. Around the Arctic Ocean, for instance, autumn is by far the snowiest time of year, when the sea has largely thawed, when the water is warm relative to the air above it, which leads to saturation, and when the air is already cold enough for snow. The Great Lakes definitely saturate the air in autumn when they're warm relative to the air above them, but this mostly results in clouds and rain unless a severe cold front arrives. Peak lake effect snow here tends to be in January on average, and most of this lake effect snow is caught by the western slopes of the Appalachian Mountains before it can get any farther east. On the other side of the Appalachians, the primary source of snow is very different. It's the nor'easter. These are massive cyclones, that form thanks to the high temperature contrast between the cold continent and the warmer ocean, and they tend to follow the east coast, moving northeastward. And across the mid-Atlantic and much of the northeast, they tend to drop the greatest amount of snow in February. Why February in particular? Well, nor'easters happen throughout the winter, but meteorologists suggest that places like New York City get more February snow because that's when the nearshore waters are colder. The storm will still get plenty of moisture from the Atlantic in February, but those colder shelf waters will allow for colder onshore winds and therefore more snow. One of the most unusual features of North American climate is the March snow belt, an area where peak snowfall typically occurs in March. This area encompasses parts of the high plains of eastern Colorado and Wyoming, some of the adjacent slopes of the Rockies, as well as some of the prairie and Black Hills to the northeast. In parts of the eastern Rockies and Black Hills, the average snowiest month of the year can even be April. What's going on with the late snow in these areas? Well, the western slopes of the Rockies, the Sierra Nevadas, and the Cascades get plenty of snow during normal westerly flow. Air laden with Pacific moisture is forced to rise up the mountain slopes, producing orographic snow. But this leaves the March snow belt dry. They're in a rain shadow, or snow shadow, you could say. So they need to get their moisture from a different source. They get most of their snow when a strong low pressure system draws in a slice of humid air from the Gulf of Mexico, a slice of cold air from Canada, and forces them together to produce fronts. And this works even better thanks to the slope of the Great Plains. Our Great Plains are essentially a giant, gradually sloping ramp. The counterclockwise motion around the low forces air upslope and into the Rockies. And even just forcing air upslope can produce precipitation on its own. But why March? Well, in peak winter, the jet stream and the storms it helps to produce are typically farther south over the Gulf states, where there's a strong temperature contrast between the cold continent and the warm Gulf. There, they produce heavy rain and even winter tornadoes. In summer, the jet stream is farther north and it's not producing as many storms. It's the transition seasons, when it spends more time over this area. But storm development is even more pronounced here in spring due to stark temperature contrasts, both vertically and horizontally. There's a horizontal temperature gradient between the still frozen Arctic and the rapidly warming south, and there's a vertical temperature gradient as well, because the atmosphere is still cooler aloft and it's rapidly warming below. Both lead to stronger storms. Of course, there are loads of other factors that can affect how you experience winter. One of them is wind chill, and I won't go into that in detail, but I can at least say that the strongest winds are typically associated with low pressure systems, so apply that to much of the information I've provided so far. Fog and cloud cover also dramatically impact what weather feels like, both physically and psychologically. There are a number of fog basins throughout the world. The Po Valley in northern Italy, the Ebro Valley in Spain, 
the Central Valley in California, and the Columbia River Basin in Washington. These areas are often affected by prolonged winter fog or low clouds, which can even come in the form of ice fog in the Columbia River Basin. The type of fog forming in these valleys is mostly radiation fog or valley fog, which tends to form best during long nights, so early winter tends to favor this fog in particular. Like fog, cloud cover can also make winter more difficult. Although it prevents nighttime temperatures from plummeting, it also makes it more difficult for the air temperature and your body temperature to rise during the day. As mentioned earlier, winter cloud cover can be particularly heavy in areas downwind of lakes and seas when the water is warm relative to the air passing over it, which leads to saturation. Historically, how did people think about the different parts of winter? Well, of course, that varied across different time periods and in different regions. But if we're talking about areas with at least some cold winter weather, there is one consistency you'll find. Late winter, and even early spring, were exceptionally challenging. Because on top of the cold weather, food supplies were at their lowest. This was the starving time. Most crops were harvested from midsummer to fall, and most animals were slaughtered in the fall. That means stored grains, roots, winter squash, and other foods could be in short supply later in the winter and into spring. Although there are some crops that grow well in the cool weather of spring, even those crops wouldn't be ready to harvest until late spring or early summer. So aside from some hardy greens in the field and whatever you have left, food could be scarce. That's why if there was some wild resource that became abundant during the spring, people really took advantage of it. One such example is the shad run in eastern North America, when millions of shad would swim upriver in spring. Crowds of people, made hungry by the long winter, would gather by the riverbanks to hook or net these fish. Spring may not have been a time of plenty, historically, but there are loads of ancient holidays and festivals celebrating its arrival, and some are surprisingly early in the year, in places where the weather can still be unforgiving. These aren't celebrations of plenty, like an autumn harvest festival, but they provide for people something just as important, hope, and the sense of a new beginning. As always, the sources for this video are in the description. Thanks for watching. If you find these topics interesting, consider subscribing. There will be many more to come.